That's right, my fellow Kino Lords. Time has finally come to unveil my top 20 favorite animated films. This is a list and a video that I've been teasing for at least two or three months now. And I'm going to be honest, I had my own top 20 list three months ago before I asked everybody for their recommendations. And I watched a lot of the films you guys recommended. That's kind of why it took me so long to develop this list because I really wanted to give a fair shot to all these great animated films that you guys recommended me that I've never even heard of or just haven't seen yet. And I can't thank y'all enough for introducing me to a lot of these animated films that I honestly didn't think would knock out some of these animated films that I had on here because when it comes to animations, you know, this is a, this is a top 20 favorites list. This isn't a top 20 like objective best list. So there's a lot of personal connection that I have with animated films. And I don't mean that to say that I just throw, you know, actual quality out the window. Um, obviously like objective quality is taken into consideration when I craft this list. But with animated films, at least, you know, from my point of view, my upbringing, you tend to have this close personal connection with them. It's, it's really hard to shake it off the list despite knowing that there are other animated films that are objectively better than them. But surprisingly, I actually had to kick out a nice handful of those films that I didn't think wouldn't make it on the list. Um, because a lot of these films that you guys recommended to me, um, just gave me these unforgettable experiences and are giving me these new memories that I'm going to cherish forever. And I just thought like from a filmmaking standpoint, we're absolutely brilliant and also really resonated with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name off all the films that I watched in preparation in crafting this list. So you have Angel's Egg, Mary and Max, Tower, It's Such a Beautiful Day. I'm going to stop naming them out because there's no way I'm going to fit them on both hands. Song of the Sea, Son of the White Mare, Triplets of Belleville, Fritz the Cat, Wolf Walkers, A Town Called Panic, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, Wolf Children, Paprika, When the Wind Blows, The Wolf House, The Night is Short Walk on Girl, Watership Down, Bayadonna of Sadness, and My Life as a Zucchini. Those are all the films that I watched in preparation for this animated films list. So I think you can guess why it kind of took me... A little while to come up with this video and come up with this list and also you have to factor in all the patron requests, all the subscriber requests, and all the patron polls that I also have to watch and put reviews out for. I also have a top 20 favorite comedies list. If you want to check that video out, go ahead. But before we move on to the list, we have to talk about the honorable mentions. These are the films that didn't quite make the list. And a good amount of these were absolutely painful and heartbreaking to not put in the top 20 list. And, you know, again, a handful of these were in the top 20, but after seeing so many of these new films... You know, I couldn't, I couldn't leave them in the list. There just wasn't enough space for them. So, Watership Down did not make the list, unfortunately. I think it's a great film, but, you know, just didn't quite make the list. The Emperor's New Groove, that one really pained me, because that's a film that, again, not only do I have a personal connection with it, but it's just a great film. Like, I think it's an excellent, uh, one of the more underrated Disney comedies that has ever come out. So, you know, that sucked to not put it on the list. Uh, Cats Don't Dance. I don't know how many of you guys have actually heard of Cats Don't Dance, but that was on the list, and I was almost sure that I was going to put it on the list, because I feel like it deserves a lot of exposure, because it kind of flew under the radar when it came out. A lot of people don't know about it, but I think Cats Don't Dance is a pretty good film. Unfortunately, you couldn't make it to the list. Uh, The Land Before Time, another heartbreaking uh selection that I couldn't put on the list, unfortunately. Um, A Town Called Panic, great film, but it didn't quite make the list. This is probably going to Ruffle some feathers here. Uh, The Lion King. I know. I'm sorry. I grew up with the film. I have a personal connection with it. I'm sorry. Just as a favorite, um, it almost made the list. But again, it just got inched out by other films. Uh, South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. Unfortunately, didn't make the list, even though I love that film. Tangled, another like underrated kind of Disney film that, you know, a lot of people talk about Frozen, but Tangled is, in my opinion, like miles better than Frozen. Uh, Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, unfortunately didn't make the list. Chicken Run, another painful selection to not put on the list. Uh, Beavis and Butthead do America, not on the list, unfortunately. Uh, When the Wind Blows, not on the list. It, that was a heartbreaking film, by the way. I do recommend that film if you've never heard of it. Um, if I could compare it to something, it would be Threads, but I think it's a whole lot better than Threads. Uh, 
I think it's a pretty good movie, but it didn't. It just unfortunately didn't make the list. Paprika, good movie, but didn't quite make the list. Uh, Song of the Sea and also Wolf Walkers. I liked Wolf Walkers better than Song of the Sea, even though I think they're both good movies. But I think Wolf Walkers is a step above Song of the Sea. Uh, still, they both couldn't quite make it on the list. Uh, Tower, which is a, it's like a, it's like a documentary that's presented with rotoscope animation. And it basically tackles this really tragic mass shooting event that happened in Texas in, I don't remember the exact year, but it was 1940s or 50s. I apologize, don't remember the year. Okay, so here are the more intense honorable mentions that are definitely going to ruffle some feathers. Angel's Egg. I watched a movie. I thought it was pretty damn good, but it didn't resonate with me all that much, even though I can acknowledge that it is a pretty good movie, and I do love the fact that it didn't feel like I was just watching an anime. It definitely feels like a film, and I really enjoyed how interpretive it is, and I just love like the aesthetic direction and the pace as a whole. It's really representative of what like an art house film would feel like. It really takes its time, and you know, it's, it's really unforgiving with its more abstract nature. So even though I admired it and I did enjoy it quite a bit and unfortunately didn't make the list, this one was really difficult to put out of the list and um, a lot of people are probably going to get pissed off about it, but Perfect Blue, it's not on the list. I know that my cousin Eric is probably filming at the mouth right now because I believe that's like one of his top five favorite animated films ever and as it is for a lot of people, um, even though I acknowledge it's a great, great film, again, it's one of those films that doesn't resonate with me as much as other films do but perfect blue is still a stunning film like i highly recommend it to anybody who hasn't seen it i have a whole review on it where i basically do nothing but praise it uh great great film um and then you have another film that was really heartbreaking for me to cut out which was Coraline. Coraline is a film that i didn't have a personal connection to but unfortunately i just couldn't keep it on the list i was just i watched too many great films it was kino overload and unfortunately it just it couldn't make the list. It couldn't make the list. Um, then you have Anomalisa, which is a Charlie Kaufman film. And that's a film that I really enjoy a lot. And I admire it a lot. But unfortunately, just couldn't make the list. Okay, this is the big one. This is the by far the most controversial one. And I'm probably going to lose some subscribers over it. Uh, please don't, don't do that. So the last honorable mention is Akira. As I said, this is a favorite films list, so even though I acknowledge that, like, on an objective level, this film is, like, mind-blowingly amazing, um, just all the craft and all the imagination and just all of the handwork that went into crafting this film is just, you know, out of this world, um, it just doesn't resonate with me that much on a personal level. And it's not a film that I can say confidently that it's in my personal top 20 favorite films. Um, again, if this was an objective best animated film, this would not only would it make the list, but it would be more than likely like in the top 10. But yeah, that's basically it for the honorable mentions. Um, hope I didn't miss any, but either way, it is what it is. If I missed any, I'll put it in the comment section or something. But that's it. Time to move on to the actual list. I know we're probably like, what, like eight minutes or 10 minutes into this video. I haven't gone to the list yet. Don't worry. I'll put a tag on the bottom if you anybody wants to skip to it. Um, all right. Let's start off with number 20, which is... So at number 20, we have the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. I know, it, I just got done saying that Akira didn't make the list, and here I am putting SpongeBob at number 20. I know, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed of myself. I'm sorry, but I'm a goofy goober, and you cannot change that about me. But no, I haven't seen this film in a long time. Um, I mean, I watched it a shit ton when it came out. Like, I watched this film at least 10 or 15 times when it came out when I was obviously way younger. But I basically haven't seen it since then. And I remember everybody kept telling me, like, oh, the SpongeBob movie is still a fantastic animated film. Like, you really have to watch it. It holds up. I'm like, okay, let's give it a shot. And I watched it, and it does. This film is absolutely hilarious. Um, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's going to convert any like spongebob hater or somebody who's just not into spongebob which if you're watching this you're not into spongebob oops i dropped it in the toilet no it's a film that in my opinion does hold up in pretty much every way um the comedy and just like the the voice comedic delivery throughout this entire film um is just dead on it's 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 a hilarious film i mean that's mostly why 
I really like it is because it's absolutely hilarious, but also has tons of heart. And there is a moment in this film that I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, like, I cried necessarily, but I felt some feelings. And it's really weird to say that because the way that it's presented, it seems kind of goofy, but it is kind of emotional. Um, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I got emotional during that scene that everybody knows what I'm referring to. And, um, I think it's just really effective overall. Um, again, the comedy's on point. Um, I love the themes as well that has a lot to do with like conquering your fears and growing up and maturing as a person. Um, it's just a great animated film and I had to put it in this top 20 because after so many years of not watching it, I still just had an absolute blast with this film. So at number 19, we have The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, which is written and directed by Lot Rainiger, I believe is how you say it. It's probably not how you say it. But this is a really interesting film, and I'm glad that I was able to make space for this list for it. Um, because The Adventures of Prince Ahmed is, I believe, the oldest surviving animated film ever to exist at this point. Um, I believe, like, the actual original celluloids are still not found, but I believe nitrate copies of this film still survived, so they were able to kind of retouch and reconstruct this film, and it's definitely an achievement, and not only in animation, but just in filmmaking in general. It, this film uses this kind of silhouette technique where, you know, you can see, like, the outline and profiles of the landscape and all these figures, but... It makes it to where it not only does it enhance this kind of mood and atmosphere to the film, but it's a great way to work around like a smaller budget because you don't have to worry about all these really like meticulous finer details in the film and still craft something that does seem really detailed and something that you can tell just had tons of creative effort and also physical effort just poured right into this film. And as I was watching this film, I was like, this reminds me so much of Aladdin. I mean, there's even a character in this film whose name is Aladdin, and he finds a magic lamp and um, relinquishes a genie and has three wishes. So, but then I went further, I, w I did some further research into this film, and basically this film is based on an older book called 1001 Nights. I'm not trying to take anything away from Aladdin, I still think that's a solid animated film, but it's just really interesting to see that a film, at least the oldest surviving animated film, um, more than likely influenced a big popular hit like Aladdin. And I think it's a shame that a lot of people don't really know about this film because I could see, you know, modern audiences not really being able to get into it because it's just so old and you have to rely on a lot of like title cards and, you know, being able to interpret gestures and the visuals. But for me, this was a blast. I love this film. And just the fact that it, this is like the oldest surviving animated film and it still is really entertaining and, and engaging um was really inspiring to me and i just had a lot of fun with it so i definitely recommend the adventures of prince Ahmed, and that's why it's number 19 on my list so number 18 we have bayadonna of sadness so bayadonna of sadness is a film that i actually reviewed about a month ago um because i couldn't help but give it a watch and review it because it's like one of those films to where you just find the imagery so alluring that you have to give it a watch. And I'm really glad that I did because um, this is one trippy, one psychedelic blast of a film that, yes, has intense, heavy sexual imagery and themes to it. So, and I mean, it's really heavy in that department. This is basically, can be borderline hentai in certain points. Um, but it's not without its artistic merit. And that's one thing that I really loved about it, uh, was that it was able to be that really sexual kind of film, but still have a lot of merit to really hold up in its quality. And, you know, a lot of what this film is presented in are these kind of like standstill, like paintings as the camera kind of like, you know, pans throughout it. But then you have a lot of moments of actual genuine animation that is really like mind-blowing in certain parts um 
some of the animation and the way that it captures certain feelings and certain moments is really out of this world and is really something that if you're a fan of animation and can handle that level of content, I really recommend it because it's it's really wonderful stuff. Obviously, I love it so much that I bought it. That's my copy Bay Dawn of Sadness right here. It's a really cool um this is a really cool release. It comes with like um comes with a booklet and everything. It's it's really cool. It has like a long video it has a long essay that comes in the booklet. And it's just awesome. So, I mean, if you like this film, there's a release for it. Um I think it was like 20 something dollars, not that bad price for it. And also, I'm uh repping this shirt. This is the Bay of Dawn of Sadness shirt. Wish I could see it more, but yeah, uh, I immediately bought this on Redbubble. I'm not sponsored by Redbubble, but I'm taking offers. Bay of Sadness is awesome. If you want to hear more thoughts on it, I go a little bit more in depth in my video review, so check that out. But I love that. I love Bay of Sadness. It's a great animated film, and that's why it's number 18 on my list. <laughs> So at number 17, we have It's Such a Beautiful Day. So It's Such a Beautiful Day was probably the most frequently requested and recommended animation when I asked everybody to give me their recommendations. Um, this one pretty much popped up on everybody's list of, of recommendations. And when I was further researching this film, I saw that like people really, really love this film. Um, this was in a lot of my different uh, letterbox friends, which by the way... I have a letterbox. Follow me on there if you have one. I've seen this like in their just top five films of all time, period. Like not even animation. It's just like this is one of the favorite films ever made. And honestly, I could see why. Because this is a film that obviously is really simplistic with its, with its animation approach. But there's actually a lot of really creative editing throughout this film. Um, and also different uses of imagery and the way that the, the sound is edited and the way all the imagery is edited into the kind of like simplistic animation style um, is really incredible because the editing and the way that certain scenes are kind of compiled together, they're enhanced by the use of sound and the use of imagery throughout this film. And it's a film that, you know, maybe not everybody could get into because it is a bit, I don't want to say it's pessimistic. I would actually say it's it's a bit optimistic, especially by the end of it. But it's definitely an honest existential type of film that isn't really going to give you that conventional happy ending. And I can see a lot of people considering it to be, you know, a really heavy film to take in. And it is quite a heavy film to take in. But it's also incredibly beautiful with the kind of messages and story that it's trying to tell about this character who, again, like doesn't really seem to appreciate life because of just his upbringing and his current status in life and where he is. But I love where this film ends up and I love the ending of it because I think it does tell a really important and profound message about death and being able to appreciate death and value death in a way that makes you understand that death is a huge part of why life is valuable and yeah it's just a it's just a great film it's not even long either it's like an hour long like on the dot I think it's maybe just a little bit over an hour long so yeah please set this film out I'm really happy I watched this film um, I don't know if there's any hard copies of this like on Blu-ray, but um, I definitely want to own this film because I do think that it's quite masterful in a lot of ways. And um, I'm really happy everybody recommended this film to me. So that's why it's number 17 on my list. So number 16, we have Son of the White Mare. Son of the White Mare is a film that I actually watched and reviewed. I have a review on this. I did it a month ago. Uh, if you want to hear me go in depth, go check out that video. But Son of the White Mare is a film that I absolutely loved, obviously. It's number 16 on the list. Um, the animation style to this film is almost unlike anything that I've ever seen. It's a film that I feel like truly embraces the spirit of mythology. And it's one of the many reasons why I really took to this film. Because yes, it can get a bit repetitive at a certain point. But it feels like it's genuinely doing that just to, you know, stay authentic to to the myth. And as I stated in my review for this film, it's kind of like if the Bible, Hercules, and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time got blended together to create a monster, this would be that monster. And um, it just delivers on so much. Again, the visual style and the visual, like, animation approach to this film is really hypnotic. And, like, even if you don't think the story is really all that strong... 
the animation alone and the way that everything's presented uh, will have your eyes glued to the screen. And that's why it's number 16 on my list. So number 15, we have The Wolf House or La Casa Lobo. So The Wolf House is a film that I'm going to go ahead and shout out my man Michael Cepeda. He's a $5 patron and we always have a blast together in the Discord chat. Which by the way, if you want to join the Discord chat, $5 a month on Patreon. I highly doubt you'll regret it because we recommend films to each other all the time. Uh, we're constantly in there just shooting the shit, talking about Kino and busting each other's balls. And it's just a fun time. Um... You know, maybe, you, maybe you're not interested in the busting the balls part, but you get the idea. But he's the one that recommended this film to me, and I had no idea that this film existed. And I'm really, really happy that he introduced this film into my life. Because this is a stop-motion animation film, and it is the most unsettling stop-motion animation film that I've seen in my entire life. I mean, it's pure nightmare fuel. And what I love about it is that it never does, it never does anything cheap. To get a scare out of you. Uh, there are no jump scares in this film. But the entire film. Feels like this long. Uncomfortable ball of tension. That just never gives you any relief. And I personally love that about this film. Even though I felt like. It was like this long preemptive anxiety attack. But the film is obviously meant. To make you feel incredibly uncomfortable. And I love that about it. And the presentation is really something. Because the entire like approach. And theme of this film. It's it's basically this story propaganda piece. At least it's presented like a propaganda piece um, for the Nazis that were holding this kind of concentration camp back in Chile, like after World War II was, you know, kaput. And it essentially has these messages that put fear into children and adults not to run away from these camps because there's too much danger out there and you're better off staying in the camp because at least in the camp, you know, you'll be fed and you'll be taken care of taken care of and but obviously the way that this film is presented in this really haunting and just like unsettling and creepy way you know that pretty much tells you all you need to know about how the filmmakers feel about this subject because um you know never once does it like actually outright say that it's against this or anything but you can just tell that they are because of its presentation i think that's beautiful about the film even though it's you know, beautiful is kind of a weird thing to say about this film because it's, I'm telling you, it's fucked up. But it's able to express the horrors of this reality through its animated presentation without having to, like, vocalize it. And I think that is a wonderful aspect to this film. So yeah, obviously, I really love this film. I don't recommend watching this if you're on any type of psychedelic, whether shrooms or LSD or whatever, because this film on its own is really creepy and it feels like a really horrible trip and actually tripping watching this Something, something that you don't want any part of and it could possibly land you like in a psychiatric ward. Before we move on to the next film, there is another aspect of this film that I thought was really cool, especially for a stop motion animation. It's basically that this entire film was made to appear as if it's just one long shot. Um, it's basically doing that like one shot sequence type of thing for the entire film. I know it's kind of odd to say, especially for, for a stop motion animation, because stop motion, you know, it's basically a series of photographs put together really fast. But that's really what film is in general. But, you know, obviously with stop motion animation, it's more obvious about it. Um, but, yeah, this entire film is presented um, in this really, like, swift and smooth presentation that has these really interesting transitions from one scene to another that's made to seem like this really fluid and smooth uh, type of one-shot take. And that's another aspect of this film that I thought was really cool and incredibly impressive. And that's why it's number 15 on my list. <laughs> So number 14, we have Fantastic Planet. Fantastic Planet is a film that I talked about in my top 20 quarantine recommendations of 2020. Um, I don't have a formal review about it or anything, but Fantastic Planet is a film that I bought on Criterion because my good friend Perry recommended it to me. Also, my good cousin Eric recommended this to me. And I was like, okay, it's time for me to finally buckle down and watch it. And obviously, I'm really happy that I did because I think it's absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, it's really weird and out there, but that's one of the things that I love a lot about the film is that it definitely feels incredibly unfamiliar. And some of the alien concepts in this film do feel that way. They feel like it's something that 
we don't even like us as human beings can't even understand and the way that this one was able to uh world build in that way and demonstrate alien life in that way is an achievement. And also the classic rock, like, progressive psychedelic soundtrack that's in this film is incredible. I love it. I mean, I already love, like, you know, progressive psychedelic type of rock already. So to see it incorporated in a film of this magnitude. And obviously the social commentary in this film, I think, is really well incorporated and uh, really well fleshed out. Because essentially this entire film is just one giant piece of social commentary. It can also be viewed as metaphorical and allegorical in a lot of ways. But... Yeah, um, I, I love this film to death. This is a film that I could watch at any time. Um, even though it's really trippy and out there, and maybe a lot of people can't handle how weird it is. I tried showing this to my dad, and he was like... I, I, basically, I basically let him borrow the Criterion, and after he watched it, he was like, you know, if you're going to give me a film like this, you should have also, like, packed some joints in there, too, because you're going to need it for this kind of film. And I'm like, haha, okay, more like shrooms, but okay. But obviously, yeah, I think Fantastic Planet is fantastic, and that's why it's number 14 on my list. So number 13, we have Mary and Max. Mary and Max is another film, kind of like It's Such a Beautiful Day, that was probably one of the more reoccurring recommendations that I was getting from everybody. And it's a film that, again, obviously, I'm really happy that I saw. Because this is a film that not only did I think was like yeah, really impressive on an, on an animation standpoint, but it just really resonated with me, and I think it's going to resonate with basically anybody who feels really isolated and, you know, struggles with, you know, socializing and having a lot of anxiety disorders and depression. Because it's a film that really speaks to those kind of people and really kind of lets people in on the kind of world that you live in. And that's what I loved most about this film, was that it captures social anxiety and also just, you know intense anxiety in general and also just the feeling of alienation incredibly well and um yeah this is quite a gloomy film but again i love the way that it was able to explore these topics in a way that i haven't really seen another animation do and um it feels like the person who created this definitely understands these issues and not only did i find this film to be incredibly emotional but it's also a really important film as well. And that song or melody that's played throughout this film, I think it's called Perpetuum Mobile or something like that. Beautiful, beautiful little uh, composition. I think it's wonderful. I love the way it's incorporated into the film. And yeah, um, you know, this is a film that I'm really, really glad I watched. And I definitely want to own a copy of. And I'm really happy y'all recommended this film to me because it. I really do think it's an overlooked kind of film that a lot of people should, you know, more people should know about. So obviously, huge recommendation for Mary and Max, and that's why it's number 13 on my list. So at number 12, we have My Life as a Zucchini. So My Life as a Zucchini was actually a film that didn't get recommended to me that much, but it was on my radar for a while, and I decided to put it on my watch list. And honestly, it wasn't even in my, like, must-watch films. Like, this was actually a film that I was going to put off if I didn't have the time. But the more I looked into this film, I decided, like, maybe this should be a must-watch. So, I did, and I am so happy that I made the decision to watch this film because, um, kind of like Mary and Max, this is a film that does tackle similar themes that have to do with the true feeling of loneliness and isolation and alienation. And obviously, since this film revolves around, you know, orphans and orphanage, um, it's going to hit home on that message maybe a bit harder. And to me, this film, like, this, this film, this film made me cry a little bit. I'm not going to lie. This film, um, made me have tears roll down my face here and there. And it's just because, and not only is it just a really well-written film, but these characters are embodied incredibly well. And it's a style of animation that, again, like I think stop-motion animation is one of the best kinds of animation to capture these kinds of themes that have to do with, again, um, anxiety, social anxiety, um, alienation, depression. And this film captures that beautifully. And 
I think a lot of people who, you know, um, had, you know, kind of traumatic childhoods and uh, didn't have the best upbringing or really just lacked any kind of parental guidance in general, um, I think this could really hit home with them in a lot of ways. I think it's just a wonderful piece of art that can really show people that they're not alone. And sometimes, you know, people suck and sometimes you trust them and they stab you in the back. But sometimes it is worth to trust a human being. And, um, yeah, this is, I don't want to say too, too, too much about it because this is a film that I don't think a lot of people have seen. But it is a film that I highly recommend you. And what's really interesting too is that, um, this film is written by Celine Chiyama. Uh, the person who wrote and directed Portrait of a Lady on Fire wrote this film. And, um, you know, once the credits rolled at the end, I was like, wow, that's that could explain why the writing is so magnificent. Yeah, really beautiful film. Um, incredibly emotional, really heartwarming and touching. And that's why it's number 12 on my list. In the town where I was born. So at number 11, we have The Beatles' Yellow Submarine. Obviously, I love the shit out of this film. It's right there behind me. Um, this is a film that I grew up with and I watched many, many times as a kid and teenager. And I remember the first time I watched it as a kid, I was like immediately, I, I basically responded in the most cliche way a human being can respond to something that, you know, they see as different, which is basically just kind of with disgust and fear. <laughs> I basically was like, okay, this is not like anything I've seen before. This looks like dull and boring. So I basically didn't even watch it. Then out of boredom, I kind of came back to it. I gave it another shot, most mostly because I just love the Beatles so much. And I was baffled at how much I truly loved it after that point. Um, this is a film where, yes, it's incredibly psychedelic. And a lot of my favorite animations are apparently really psychedelic. I think it's just because you need to pour a lot of creative effort into an, into an animation in order to achieve that kind of psychedelic aesthetic. And this film achieves that incredibly well. I mean... This film is basically just kind of like one giant acid trip, and I really love it for that. And also, yes, the themes, you can argue, are really like on the nose, and the symbolism is really on the nose, but this adventure is just such a blast, and it's such a nice and positive film that can really restore your faith in humanity a little bit. The blue meanies in this film are like the villains of the film, and I think they're absolutely hilarious and also pretty like intimidating in a lot of different ways. And a lot of them like look like they're just straight up like on crack or something. But I also think in general, it's also pretty well written. Um, this film is absolutely filled with mountains of different puns and different like plays on words. And I really like it for that. I, th I find it personally hilarious. I don't know how many other people are going to find this movie funny, but I thought it was pretty damn funny. And the way most of the songs are incorporated in the film, I love. Um, I mean, obviously I love the Beatles, so I'm going to like the music quite a bit. And the Nowhere Man in this film is just precious. I love his character so much. And there's a part in the Nowhere Man song where he's kind of like spinning around in a circle crying, and that part gets to me. I I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm just kind of a sap now, but that part really gets to me, and it makes me feel very sad for that man. But yeah, I love this film to death. One of my favorite comfort films ever, and that's why it's number 11 on my list. So at number 10, we have Spirited Away, which is obviously written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. So Spirited Away, I mean, I can't say anything about Spirited Away that hasn't already been said. But obviously, this is not only one of my favorite animated films ever made, but I actually think it's one of the objective best animated films ever made. This film is just one giant, wonderful, fantastical adventure that has just so much imagination poured into it that in moments has some of the most haunting imagery that you've ever seen and makes you wonder if you should show this to anybody below the age of 10. Then you have other moments that feel like pure liberation and achievement and you can't help but really feel like you're on this adventure with this main character. And then you have other moments that feel like pure melancholy and it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, you have that incredibly beautiful uh, train scene that's like on the sea in the ocean um, just the imagery of that alone of the train tracks on the water is just, that's, that's masterful stuff. Um, definitely one of the most memorable scenes in the film and just with the music that's, that accompanies that scene beautifully. Um, I mean, again, masterful stuff here. Yeah, I actually didn't watch any Miyazaki film until my partner Jen came into my life about 10 years ago and she showed me 
all of her favorite Miyazaki films. And obviously Spirited Away was one that really stuck with me. And I'm glad that it won the Academy Award for Best Animated Film. Just truly beautiful stuff. I'm so glad the Academy didn't fuck that one up and finally gave it to something that was truly deserving of it. And also just has great messages for people to take away about really appreciating what you have and not getting greedy. And I mean, that's just one of like many different layered themes that are in this film. But yeah, as as pretty much every Miyazaki film has, it's always just wonderful messages to take from them. And yeah, obviously beautiful film. Um, this is one of those films that truly deserves all the praise that it gets. And that's why it's number 10 on my list. So number nine, we have Wally. Wally is a film that I remember when it came out, I basically just totally slept on it. Even as a kid, for some reason, I was like, I'm not rushing to see that in the theater. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shamelessly beg my dad to go watch that in the theater. But, you know, after it came out and more people were talking about it, I said, fine, I'll give Wally a watch. Like years later, I'm talking like four or five years later. And I was kicking myself in the head. I don't know how that's possible for not watching this film when it came out because this film is truly masterful in a lot of different ways honestly the first like the first act of this film is some of the best animated work i've seen ever in history of animation it's truly incredible stuff um pure visual storytelling and it's in all of its glory it's so crazy because this film's message like its environmental message and the message that it has on humanity is so incredibly on the nose, but somehow it works. I'm not really quite sure why, but there was something about this film not sugarcoating it that made me appreciate it even more. It's really weird. Like, that rarely happens in a film to where I think the message on the nose and I still like really appreciate it. And it's really entertaining and funny as well. But yeah, obviously I love Wally to death and that's why it's number nine on my list. <laughs> So number eight, we have Grave of the Fireflies. Grave of the Fireflies is a film that really took an emotional toll on me. Um, I mean, obviously you go into this film knowing that it's going to be like that, like knowing it's a film that's going to be really emotionally draining. But this is probably the the most heartbreaking animation that I've seen ever in my entire life. Um, I mean, just like the final like 35 to 40 minutes of this film is just like, non-stop heartbreak um and what i love about this film too is that yeah it's definitely trying to go over something that is trying to break your heart and really trying to make you sad but it's also very detailed about what it's trying to say about people who did live during this time of crisis and one of the most memorable scenes in the film is where they eat the last piece of candy that they have in the little container and once they finish the piece of candy they fill up the container with water and drink it. And they really enjoy that as a treat as well. And it is goes to show that when you're in a time where resources are incredibly scarce and limited, and I think this film demonstrated that beautifully. But, you know, that's just one of many scenes and many themes that are demonstrated in this film. But that's just one that really stuck to me. And, yeah, like, everything that everybody says about this film is absolutely true. It's it's going to be one of the most heartbreaking films that you'll ever witness, but also just holds up as just an incredibly well animated film as well. So yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen Grave of the Fireflies, you know, go into it expecting to feel absolutely drained afterwards. But yeah, in my opinion, it's not only my favorite animated film, but I do think it's one of the best animated films ever made. And that's why it's number eight on my list. So at number seven, we have The Nightmare Before Christmas. So Nightmare Before Christmas is obviously a film that I have a personal connection with. Um, it's a film that I grew up with. It terrified me, but it also moved me. I've seen this film more times than any person should probably see a film, but it just truly never gets old. The music in it is fantastic. And obviously, like, the claymation and stop-motion animation um and the, also just the the design of it is incredibly iconic and what's amazing about the film too is that you can pop it in in october and just keep watching it all the way through december because it just matches it matches each holiday incredibly well and it's also kind of tragic that due to the marketing of this film uh the vast majority of people think tim burton directed this movie when it's it's henry Selleck. you know we don't know who henry Selleck is but 
Um, he also directed Coraline, and I think he gets more credit for that one as well. But I remember, like, when I was watching the previews for Coraline, when it first came out, it was, like, from the creators of The Nightmare Before Christmas. And at the time, I was like, you know, I believed it was Tim Burton because I was young. And I was like, oh, that's Tim Burton. I guess Tim Burton also made Coraline. And I'm sure the vast majority of people were also thinking that. But it's it's a shame because, you know, Henry Selleck deserves his own credit. But nobody ever talks about Henry Selleck. But, um, yeah, either way, The Nightmare Before Christmas um an awesome animated film obviously and that's why it's number seven on my list so number six we have fantastic mr fox which is written and directed by wes anderson so obviously i really love wes anderson as a filmmaker um i mean my personal favorite from wes anderson is the life aquatic but if i had a pick from his animations isle of dogs or fantastic mr fox um, look, I like Isle of Dogs. I think it's a good movie, but Fantastic Mr. Fox, I think is, I don't want to say is leagues above it, but it's definitely a whole leg above it. Like pretty much every Wes Anderson film that I've ever seen, um, it's just such a charming and heartwarming type of film that is insanely rewatchable. Uh, this is a film you could pop in at any moment and, um, will not take a toll on you at all, but you know, is it like the lightest film? Like, yeah, it's lighthearted. But that doesn't mean that it's void of any kind of like real messages or substance. Um, you know, I love the messages that are demonstrated in this film that have to do with a lot with, you know, the social pressure to impress people or the social pressure to move up in life. But it's also just a hilarious film as well. And again, like most Wes Anderson films, it's not like this really slapsticky punchline type of humor all the time. Uh, most of the humor in this film is just you know, really clever, quite witty type of humor. And it creates some of the most memorable stuff I've ever seen. I love how the characters in this film, whenever they want to say cuss word, they, they just say the word cuss. Are you cussing with me? No, you cussing with me. Don't cuss and point you're gonna me. You're going to cuss with somebody. You're, you're not going to cuss you're with me, you little cuss. cuss. With me. <laughs> it's weird, but it's really funny. And it's a really cute way to kind of work around the MPAA system and make it to where this film can be rated PG so that you know, that way more people of all ages can watch this film. Yeah, this film is incredibly well written, incredibly well voice acted, obviously really well directed. Wes Anderson has his signature tracking shots, his signature zoom ins and zoom outs. That's quite apparent all across this film. So um, I love this film to death and that's why it's number six on my list. Somebody once told me the world is gonna roll me. So what am I gonna say? I mean... I don't know how high Shrek ranks amongst everybody else's favorite animated films. But Shrek is a film that, time and time again, even though I've seen it over a billion times, the sting just never seems to wear off. Um, this is a film that, yeah, like especially with its Smash Mouth intro song, uh, reeks up the early 2000s, and also there's like a slow motion Matrix reference that is like so 2000s. But... Overall, it ages incredibly well. Like, this is a film that people are going to watch 30 years from now and still be like, that's a great film. Um, it's an animation that, you know, obviously kids saw it, everybody saw it, but it was really, really genius at incorporating a lot of, like, older adult type of humor in it. And it's really, like, sometimes subtle and sometimes really, like, obvious way that somehow slipped through the cracks of the MPAA. That must be Lord Farquaad's castle. Uh-huh, that's the place. Do you think maybe he's compensating for something? <laughs> Show me the princess. <laughs> ah, perfect. Please keep up on the grass, shine your shoes, wipe your... And the casting for the voice actors in this film are pitch perfect. Mike Myers as Shrek, Eddie Murphy as Donkey, Cameron Diaz as Princess Fiona. I mean, it's, you couldn't, you couldn't cast better than that. Like, if it wasn't, it's one of those times where it's like, you really wonder what this film would be like if it were casted differently. Like, it probably wouldn't even have lived to be remembered as long as it was and be hailed as greatly as it is, which is really insane to think about because the writing is great and everything else about it is great, but the voice acting is definitely something that really elevated the material. And I don't know, I just love the humor of this film. This is just one of the most consistently hilarious films that I've ever seen in my entire life. I know the punchline to every joke. I pretty much know everything that's in this film. I can pretty much quote, this is one of the films that I can literally quote from the beginning of the script to the very end of it. 
and without missing a beat, and I somehow still am dying of laughter from watching this film. So, yeah, uh, Shrek, again, I don't know where it's going to land for y'all, but for me, it's number five on my list. I love it so damn much. So number four, we have Ratatouille. Ratatouille is such an amazing film. Uh, Ratatouille is perfection. This is one of Pixar's best films. And what I love so much about this film is that it's so mature for a kid's film. Um, this is a film that even though as a kid, you know, you might not resonate with all the themes that are presented in this film, but there's still enough there for a kid to really find a lot of enjoyment in. And to me, this is one of the more original Pixar films. And I wish they would go back to putting more creativity into these more original ideas. And I love the character of the critic in this film. And I love the conclusion of his character that basically demonstrates the kind of impact food has on our memories and just on our emotions. It just shows you that food is actually a very meaningful and intimate thing in our lives. And that's kind of what I meant by this film being a bit mature because it does demonstrate these types of things. That sure, like a kid, I think could grasp on a certain level, but I think as as you grow up, um, they tend to resonate with you a lot more. But yeah, Ratatouille, amazing film. I think it's perfect. It's a 10 out of 10 for me, and that's why it's number four on my list. So at number three, we have Princess Mononoke. So at number three, we have Princess Mononoke. I know maybe y'all thought that Spirited Away was going to be the only Miyazaki film that I had on this list, but if you thought that, you were wrong. Uh, Princess Mononoke is number three on my list because I think that obviously it is one of the best animated films that I've seen in my entire life. Um, yes, I obviously like this better than Spirited Away because I feel like throughout this entire film from start to finish, I am absolutely glued to the screen. Um, this is a film where I don't think there's any amount of unnecessary information or any unnecessary scene. Um, everything in this film is incredibly purposeful for what it's trying to say about its theme, its story, and its characters. Um, I love the environmental theme in this film. Um, it feels very natural, too. It doesn't feel like it's too preachy. Um, it does a great job at sending a powerful message, again, in this more subtle and representative kind of way. That really resonated with me. Many of them can be incredibly iconic. Whether it's the little forest sprites. Or the forest spirit itself. Which by the way. The route they go with the forest spirit. The entire third act. I thought was incredibly bold and daring. I mean that scene. The all scene that we all know of. That happens to the forest spirit in the third act. Um, just really shocked me. Like my jaw was on the floor during that scene. And I was just really impressed. To see an animation like that. That was that daring. To just go all the way with it. And. Um, not be afraid to show something that is going to upset a lot of people. And obviously, it goes without saying that it's just beautifully animated. Uh, the animation in this film is absolutely incredible. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to talk about Miyazaki films because they've been talked to death already. And for good reason, because they're brilliant pieces of filmmaking. But uh, Princess Mononoke is my favorite Miyazaki film. That's why it's number three on my list. I don't dance in do -de -do. <laughs> So number two, we have Triplets of Belleville. So Triplets of Belleville is a film that I've been dying to talk to you guys about. Because it's a film that I've never heard of up until this point. Um, I give a quick shout out to Iva... Hold on, let me try to pronounce her name. I'm going to butcher the hell out of this, but I tried. Iva Kijev Cannon. Um, she's from Serbia. She reached out to me on, on Instagram one day. And we've been friends ever since. And she recommended this film to me when I asked for recommendations for animated films. And this one just completely blew me away. Um, this is a film that encapsulates everything that I love about the art of filmmaking. Um, what's so beautiful about Triplets of Belleville is that it doesn't matter which part of the world you live in. You can watch this film without any subtitles and still be incredibly impacted throughout its entire runtime because it uses its universal language of visual storytelling to convey everything that it wants to express to its audience. Whether it's story information, whether it's character information, 
whether it's the themes, whether it's the emotions, um, all of that is conveyed to the audience through the visual storytelling means or just through aesthetic means. And it's beautiful stuff. I was thrilled by this entire film. Um, yeah, like a lot of things in this film are really exaggerated, but that didn't bother me at all in this film. I found it to be, um, something that actually enhanced the experience because the things that were exaggerated were either there to tell you something about the character or about the setting or that had some sort of symbolic meaning to it. And I absolutely love that about it. And come on, like a fat statue of Liberty. That is, that is bold. And that is amazing. But yeah. I was completely astonished by this film from start to finish. The grandma character in this film, such a strong female lead. Gotta love that character so much. Um, and also the three, I believe there's three old, um, theater play ladies that were in the beginning that are also reincorporated later in the film. Great characters as well. I love kind of what they represented in terms of the lifestyle they live. And yeah, just, I, I don't want to say too much about it because again, most people who are probably watching this have never heard of it. And I want you to go into it, you know, not knowing that much about the film, but just know that this film, um, it, it has, it has a universal language to it. Um, as I said, it doesn't matter which part of the world you're in. You can watch this film and completely fall in love with it and be impacted by it. And I think there's something about that that is completely beautiful. So um, Triplets of Belleville is a film that I completely fell in love with. I consider it to be, again, not only one of my favorite animated films of all time, but one of the best animated films ever made in the history of animation. So um, that's why it's number two on my list. Baby, baby, won't you take my hand? Don't be afraid. I'm sorry, I I couldn't resist the Norm of the North joke. I I had to do it to him. But no, really, my favorite animated film of all time is When somebody loved me, everything was beautiful. Toy Story 2. Um yeah, I'm sure a lot of y'all guessed it was gonna be Toy Story, but maybe didn't know which one. Which by the way, I should have said this earlier. I chose Shrek and not Shrek 2. Just because I didn't want to include two Shreks, you know, in the top 20. Even though, technically, uh, I love Shrek 2 to death. But I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be more inclusive with the list. I didn't want to crowd it up with sequels. But, um, so I had to pick out of all the four Toy Story movies that have come out so far. And, um, Toy Story 2 is my favorite. The first Toy Story was my favorite for quite a while. But the more I watch Toy Story 2, the more that becomes my favorite. Because it's just so... Not only do I think it's just masterful in every single regard whether it's the the character arcs or the humor uh, all right nobody look till i get my cork back in buzz light you're the star command i've got an a wall space ranger tell me i wasn't this deluded no back talk but the level of emotion that this film is able to achieve with we all know what I'm talking about mostly. I'm talking about Jesse's backstory and the montage with the song. That shit is absolutely soul crushing, but it's brilliant filmmaking. I mean, Jesse's song is out of this world heartbreaking, but it's one of the most beautiful pieces of art that I've ever seen put to screen. And if that doesn't get you to really cherish a lot of the meaningful objects that, you know, you had a connection with when you grew up, I don't know what will, because that is a goddamn showstopper. What's also insane is that Toy Story 2 was originally going to be this kind of crappy, straight-to-DVD kind of sequel, but then they were having trouble with production or, you know, what have you, and then John Lasseter came in, and he basically amped everybody up and just poured a lot of creativity into the project, and then we got something... That was actually a slightly a slight step above the original Toy Story. This is just, I think, is a perfect animated film. It's absolutely perfect. One of the best sequels to any animated film, or obviously in my opinion, I do think it is the best sequel to any animated film that I've seen. If anybody wants to put up a challenger, I would love to see it. But this film uh, resonated with me so much. The more I watch it, the more I love it. And, um, you know, I don't know where this is going to land with everybody. Maybe y'all will be disappointed that I picked something big like Toy Story as my number one, but um, I can't help it. Um, not only does this film have a deep personal connection with me, 
but I think it just holds up in every way possible. So that's why it's number one on my list. Well, that's my list, everybody. Um, I'm sure it's going to be quite a long video. It's probably going to be over 40 minutes to 50 minutes long. But um, if you stuck around for the whole thing, that really means quite a bit to me. I'll make sure to put a link in the description box of all the films that I talked about, about in this list that I actually have like standalone reviews for. But I want to give one last thanks to everybody who recommended me all their favorite animated films or films that um, you know you feel are underappreciated because there were quite a bit of films in here that I didn't think we were gonna make the list, but they did, and they actually kicked out films that I had a deep personal connection with because they're just better films in every regard. So um, really, really happy to see a lot of enthusiasm of everybody bringing this to my attention. So thank you so very much, and um, that's it. If you really like this video, please give it that thumbs up and share it amongst your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel to be updated on more film-related content.